Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Etate Sarvam Akyatam Etate Sarvam Akyatam Yat Prishto Ham Ihatvaya Prishto Ham Ihatvaya Tat Komari Hari Kritam Komari Hari Kritam Hogande Padi Kirtitam Kiritam Etate Sarvam Adyatam Etate Sarvam Adyatam Yat Prishto Ham Ihatvaya Tat Komari Hadi Kritam Hogande Padi Kiritam Etate Sarvam Akyatam Etate Sarvam Akyatam Yat Prishto Ham Ihatvaya Tat Komari Hadi Kritam Paugande Padi Kiritam this te unto you sarvam all akyatam described yat which prishta requested aham i iha in this regard Twaya by you, Tat that Komare in his early childhood up to the end of his fifth year, Hadi Kritam performed by Lord Hadi Haugande in later childhood beginning with his sixth year, Padikiditam, glorified. 
Since you inquired from me, I have fully described to you those activities of Lord Hadi that were performed in his fifth year, but not celebrated until his sixth. Etat surid bish charitam muradir aghadanam sak Balacha Jemanam Cha Vyakte Tadar Rupam Achor Vivishastuham Srinbam Grinan Etinado Kilartan. Any person who hears or chants these pastimes, Lord Marari performed with his cowherd friends the killing of Aghasura, the taking of lunch on the forest grass, the Lord's manifestation of transcendental forms, and the wonderful prayers offered by Lord Brahma, is sure to achieve all his spiritual desires. Purport. According to Srila Sanatan Goswami, even one who is not, who is only inclined to hear and chant the pastimes of Lord Krishna will achieve spiritual perfection. Many devotees seriously engaged in propagating Krishna consciousness are often so busy that they cannot chant and hear the pastimes of the Lord to their full satisfaction. However, simply by their intense desire to always chant and hear about Lord Krishna, they will achieve spiritual perfection. Of course, as far as possible, one should actually vibrate these transcendental pastimes of the Lord. Om Ajnan Timidandasya Gyananjanat Salakaya Chakshurum Militam Jena Tasmai Sri Gurave Namaha Sri Chaitanya Manobhishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Tadati Svapadantikam Bandeham Sri Guru Sri Juthapadakamalam Sri Guru Vaishnavam Scha Sri Rupam Sagrajataham Sahakana Raghunathan Bitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padan Sahakana Radha Sri Vishakan Vitamscha He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kansana Gaurangi Radhe Brinda Veneshwari Brishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Bansha Kalpat Rubyascha Kripa Sindubya Evacha Patitanam Bhavani Bio Vaishnavibyo Namo Namaha Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Shivasadi Gauda Bhakta Brinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare Any person who hears or chants these pastimes Lord Murari performed with his cowherd friends, the killing of Akasura, the taking of lunch on the forest grass, 
the Lord's manifestation of transcendental forms and the wonderful prayers offered by Lord Brahma is sure to achieve all his spiritual desires. We are reading this morning from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 10, Chapter 14, entitled Brahma's Prayers to Lord Krishna, Texts 59 and 60. The last several chapters that Shukadev Goswami has spoken were inspired by one simple question by Parikshit Maharaj. Parikshit Maharaj was deeply eager to hear Krishna's pastimes. He was cursed to die in seven days when he was still quite young at the prime of his career as the king of the world and on the banks of the Ganga in North India he vowed to fast until death not for the sake of fasting, but for the sake of giving his 100% full attention and energy to hearing the glories of the Lord without the slightest distraction. And all the sages and rishis understanding his motive, he was so eager so determined to perfect his life in those seven days that Krishna in his heart sent the greatest and sages from all over the universe. Just like little Dhruva Maharaj, although a five-year-old child, when he was crushed by his mother's words, his stepmother, Suruchi. He felt totally humiliated. Krishna tells in Gita for a Kshatriya who has been honored, dishonor is worse than death. Here he was in such a esteemed position. He was the son of a king, extremely powerful. And he had every type of luxury that can be imagined. But still, even in that situation, sufferings come. No one is exempt from suffering in this world. No one, whatever our position, can escape reversals. Greatness is how we respond to those reversals. Greatness is not about reversals not coming because we are so great. So despite his extremely exalted position as the prince and all the wealth and power that was his as a child. He couldn't find happiness in anything after his stepmother insulted him. And his father, he didn't say anything. He didn't agree with his stepmother. 
He didn't disagree with her. He just remained silent. And to Dhruva, that was total betrayal. The king Uttanapada, he did not consciously betray his son. If he had time to think about it, he would have likely acted differently. But it was one of those situations that just happened at the moment. His beloved son is trying to crawl on his lap. His very beloved favorite wife, due to her enormous ego of feeling privileged by his effect, the king's affection, she spoke scornfully toward him. Well, this was quite a political situation as far as family matters go. If he would have said, no, Druva, don't listen to that woman, come on my lap, then he would have been in big trouble with his step wife because he would have been completely defying her publicly in the pages of Srimad Bhagavatam. So he didn't want to do that. And at the same time, he didn't want to hurt his son. It would, so he, he didn't do anything. But his not doing anything to Saruchi confirmed that he is mine. He loves me the most. But to Dhruva, it meant that my father cares nothing for me anymore. He felt totally betrayed. Sometimes in this world, situations happen at the moment where we just may not think very carefully about what we do or what we say. And it has such results. For King Uttanapada, this was the greatest trauma of his life. Dhruva was so infuriated, so heartbroken, that he left his home, left his wealth, left his safety, and went deep into a jungle where nobody could find him. And after he left, Uttanapada was in total grief. What have I done? What a mistake. Why didn't I say something? How could I have been so cruel? He didn't mean it. He just made a very bad choice at a very, very traumatic moment. And he didn't have time to think about it after that because within minutes, Druva was gone. <clears throat> and a similar thing happened to King Parikshit. He was the king of the world. He was extremely thirsty. He was in a forest. He went to a sage's house to get some water. And the sage was sitting in meditation. And king told him, I'm here, I'm the emperor. At least give me water. And Parikshit Maharaj, just that one moment, he made a mistake. If he could have just thought about it, if he would have just thought about it, he would never have done this. His whole life he honored and worshipped the Brahmins and the Rishis and sages. But in this situation, when he was extremely thirsty, he just misinterpreted the situation. He didn't want to make an offense. He was thinking that the person was ignoring him. Because sometimes Brahmins can be like that. that we're the greatest. Why should we wait on a king, a mere king? They should be at our feet. Samik Rishi was a pure soul. But in that moment of thirst, of trauma, he felt insulted by Samik Rishi. And in that moment, he 
took that dead snake with his bow and put it on Samikrishi's shoulder. Here is, you're a Brahmin, here is your garland I offer you. Then he left. And as he was going home, he totally regretted what he did. But the reaction due to that situation was he was cursed to die in seven days. For King Uttanapada, his his little son going to the forest was worse than a curse of dying in seven days, in one sense. He was totally, he loved his son dearly. He didn't want to hurt him. He didn't mean to hurt him. But he did. In both cases, it's interesting, both Parikshit and Uttanapada, who are both emperors of the planet, they were both totally hurt by little children. Shringi was only about five years old, and Druva was only five years old. So here they are in the most powerful positions with great armies, great heritage, and so much pain caused by tiny little children. One leaves home, one curses. Bhutanapada was beside himself with grief. And Parikshit Maharaj, he understood with a positive attitude. This is Krishna's blessing. In both cases, because they were both great devotees, Uttanapada and Parikshit, because they were both great devotees, the trauma became the greatest blessing of their lives. For Parikshit Maharaj, he left everything, went to the Ganga, vowed to fast, and Krishna saw his siri, how serious he was. How serious this man was that he left everything just to hear about Krishna. There was such a sense of sharanagati, surrender. He was surrendering his life, his everything, just to hear about Krishna. And he was so eager He wasn't feeling cursed. He was feeling blessed. And because of that situation, Krishna in the heart of all the sages and the rishis throughout the world and the universe, he sent them all to be there. And ultimately, he sent Shukadeva Goswami to speak Srimad Bhagavatam. And in the case of Uttanapada, his son Dhruva, was so eager to find God that Krishna sent Narada Muni to enlighten him. And ultimately, when Dhruva came home, King Uttanapada was the happiest person in creation because now not only was his son home and safe, but he was, he was in Mahabhagavat. He was a self-realized, enlightened soul at five years old. So both of these dramas, where there was some regrettable mistakes, became the greatest blessings because they were Krishna conscious. So Parikshit Maharaj He was so eager to hear. Shukadeva Goswami spoke throughout the day, every day, nine cantos. How many of you have sat down all day, every day, and read within, let us say, four or five days, nine cantos? It's a lot of subject matter to sit and listen to. 
And, <clears throat> and now we're at the tenth canto. And Parikshit Maharaj is listening so carefully. It's not that he's just sitting there and, and okay, I vow to fast till death and I'm going to hear until I die, so I'm just going to let these vibrations come in my mind, in my heart, until I die. He was every word. He was so thirsty, so hungry, so determined to hear, to process, to digest every single word of the Srimad Bhagavatam. And we find that the, the questions that Parikshit Maharaj asks throughout the Srimad Bhagavatam so deeply give us a sense of how he's listening. Shukadev Goswami tells how Krishna killed Agasura. <clears throat> and in the flow of his narration, he said, but the killing of Agasura was not spoken about in Vrindavan until one year after. And then Parikshit Maharaj continues on. I mean, Shukadev Goswami continues on. But Parikshit Maharaj inquires, how is that possible? Can you explain to me? If he, if he killed... Akasura and liberated him in his Kumar age, why is it that it wasn't discussed until his Poganda age? Similarly, we read so many instances where Shukadev Goswami describes how the gopis and the cows of Vrindavan, they loved Krishna more than their own children. He just said that and was in the part of the narration. And Parikshit Maharaj said, wait, how is it possible for anyone to love somebody else's child more than their own? He was really listening. So in this case of Agasura, <clears throat> Shukadeva Goswami, he was so thrilled by these questions. He had already told Shukadeva Goswami that because you are so eager to hear, you are empowering me to be eager to speak. And Srila Prabhupada explains the transmission of transcendental knowledge is when the speaker is empowered to speak in the and the hearer is empowered to hear, and they are both empowering each other. Incredible. Sukadev Goswami is thanking Parikshit Maharaj for his enthusiasm, because it's empowering him. That is how Krishna works. When someone is eager to hear about Krishna in order to facilitate that person's hearing, Krishna sends somebody and that devotee's desire to hear is so pleasing to Krishna that the Paramatma in the speaker's heart inspires the speaker to speak for that person's benefit. That's transparent via media. Sukadev was so eager to speak, he was enthusing Parikshit. Parikshit was so eager to hear, he was enthusing Shukadev Goswami. And this was going on moment after moment. Their eagerness was ever increasing. This was their loving relationship. And here, by the time the tenth canto comes, they're really eager. And Shukadeva Goswami is so ecstatic to hear this question. You know, considering that Parikshit Maharaj had only seven days to live, um, Shukadeva Goswami could have just, you know, rushed through, you know, his narration and then 
you know, answer his question. And he, he has answered. He was so enthusiastic about this question. He goes in so much great detail to explain why. Vrindavan Das Thakur tells that <clears throat> if Lord Ganesh would write the pastimes of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, even for an entire day of Brahma, and he's the most expert writer, he couldn't describe what Lord Chaitanya does in one day. If Ananta Shesha, with his many mouths, he has so many hoods, and so many mouths, if he were to, to, to chant the glories of the pastimes of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu for an entire day of Brahma, hundreds of mouths, he couldn't adequately describe what Lord Chaitanya does in one day. This is how the Lord performs his libas. Shukadeva Goswami tells us that when Krishna performed his Ras Lila on Sarat Purnima, it seemed like one night. One night is only... He began at sunset... And, you know, he and the gopis were all actually home by before sunrise. So how many hours? Usually the sun sets about six. It rises around, it's probably about ten hours when it's dark between sunset and sunrise. But in that, 12, in that ten hours, Krishna performed leelas, for a day of Brahma, a whole night of Brahma, just billions of years. He performed that many pastimes in that ten hours. It's an example. How do you describe it? Shukadeva Goswami just describes a little, a little tiny drop. Vrindavan Das Thakur tells in regard to Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, They're trying to describe the pastimes of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. It's like a little tiny bird trying to fly across the whole sky. How much of the sky can a bird cover? But whatever little distance, which is totally insignificant compared to the unlimited sky, the bird tries his best. That's all he could do. And Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami tells that in his explanation of Lord Chaitanya's Leela, Lord, actually Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says the same thing to Rupa Goswami. In my explanation of Krishna, Krishna's pastimes, Krishna's qualities are like an unlimited ocean an ocean that has no bottom and no shores. Unlimited ocean. And he said, all I could do is try to describe the quantity, the quality of one drop. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says that's all he could do, is describe one drop from this unlimited ocean. So for Shukadev Goswami, who is such a enlightened, empowered soul, son of Vyasdev, can you imagine how many pastimes he knows? But whatever he knows is only a drop. And whatever he could speak in seven days is only a drop within the ocean of what he knows, which is only a drop of what Krishna does. So 
So he is extracting, you know, what Krishna did in his leelas are unlimited. Imagine, Krishna was in Vrindavan for about 12 years performing leelas all day, every day. There's unlimited quadrillions upon quadrillions of quadrillions of leelas he did. That's God. He's ananta. He's unlimited, inconceivable, achuta, infallible. Achintya. And Sukadeva Goswami, he's describing these very, very precious pastimes that he has personally selected for Pariksit Maharaj. And he describes how Krishna, after killing Agasura, was very hungry with his children because that was quite a leela. These yoga maya would would somehow or other arrange for these asuras sent by Kamsa to come at very, very um, favorable times. Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur tells that when Krishna and Gopas would play, their playing was so ecstatic that it would be impossible for them to stop playing. It was just too wonderful. But at the same time, Yashoda Mai and all of the elder gopis, they had prepared lunch and packages. Prabhupada said tiffins for the boys to go out to, to have in the cowherd pastures. And Yashoda Mai's food cannot go wasted. And ultimately, Krishna wants to taste the food of his mother and his mother wants him to taste his food for her food because of nourishment and, and enjoyment. So demons would come right in the middle of the summit of their play and their play was always at a summit from beginning to end. Just so the play would stop and there would be something else to do and in the process of you know, dealing with these incredible asuras, it would really make their appetite extremely um, enlivened. And so they were hungry for the food of their mothers. And their mothers, they, they would cook with a hunger to please their children. So everything, even though the... In the pasture grounds, this sakyaras was so ecstatic. Still, the vatsalyaras was going on so deeply. They would all come and take the love of their mothers and all the mothers' love for Krishna, especially Yashodamai. So as they were sitting down on the bank of Yamuna to take their prasad, Lord Brahma, he came down to see, how is this that little Gopal has killed Agasura? And he was hearing all the other devas because they feared Agasura. He was such a dangerous person. The demigods were petrified with fear of this demon. He was unconquerable. And little Gopal is not only did he kill him, but he gave him liberation in the spiritual world as one of his eternal associates. So when the demigods saw this, they were playing drums and singing and celebrating, and Brahma came down to see what is this celebration. And he wanted to test, what did, who is this Gopal? He was bewildered. In that split moment, he was bewildered. He wanted to see what is this Krishna. So he kidnapped all the calves and all the cowherd boys. 
and Krishna. Just to give even more pleasure to everyone through this pastime, he made what Brahma was thinking was going to be a great reversal for the whole bridge, for the whole Brindavan. He, for one year, he was taking them away. And he came back down after a year to see how much trouble he caused. But when he came down, he saw everything was exactly the same. And he's the creator. How thorough Krishna is in his lila. He expanded himself as every calf. And there were hundreds of, there were millions and millions of calves. We can't even count. It describes at the beginning of the chapter of Agasura when Krishna and his gopas were going out, there was unlimited calves practically. Millions and millions and millions. Hare Krishna. And he expanded as each and every one of them. And each and every boy. So thorough was his expansion. They were all Krishna. That for the whole year, not a single mother cow had the slightest thought that this is not my child. Not a single elder gopi or gopa, mother or father, for one year had the slightest thought that this is someone else. Their bodies were replicas. Not only their bodies, but all of their characteristics, their emotions, the sound of their voice, the way they talked, all their desires. You know, parents know the desires of their little children. Every single desire was a replica of their child. The things they talked about were replicas of their child. Their relationships with them, their memories of what happened in their household were replicas of their children. The only difference is they were, they were, they didn't even question it. It was just a reality. They loved their children infinitely more than they ever loved their children before. They loved their children exactly the way they loved Krishna. But now Krishna had become their child. But they had no conception that this is Krishna. Even though their love increased infinitely, still Krishna was so convincing to be their children that they just loved their children more than ever before, but never questioned why. Now, Brahma is the creator. This is a higher level than being a parent. The parent is, is like a, you know, Mahavishnu is creator. And then Brahma is like a secondary creator. And parents are like a th- secondary, third dairy, I don't know what it's called. <laughs> His parents are down the line as creators. They're coming in that hierarchy of creators. So Brahma, he knows his creation. He has four heads. He's seeing you know, all four directions thoroughly. And even as the creator of the universe, Brahma saw all the calves and all the gopas, and he couldn't understand that they were all Krishna. They were so exact replicas. Beyond replicas, they were Krishna. (laughs) He was totally bewildered. He couldn't understand that it was Krishna. And he couldn't understand that all these children who he had, you know, stored away somewhere, were all They were there in their mystic slumber, and at the same time, they were all playing with Krishna. How is this possible? 
It was, Brahma was bewildered. He became so bewildered that he couldn't talk. He couldn't even move. He became like a statue. He was so stunned. And then Krishna manifested every child as four-armed Vishnu with, with all great demigods and sages worshipping each one. And Brahma saw that. He became even more totally bewildered. And then all the Vishnus disappeared. Millions of Vishnus. Just to see one form of Vishnu is the perfection of life. <laughs> Brahma was seeing millions of them. And around each Vishnu was so many great souls worshipping. All the Vishnus disappear and all that's left is little Gopal with his yogurt, dahi and fruit mixture in his hand. Exactly as he was one year before. And incredible, the fruit salad was still perfectly fresh. <laughs> you know, yogurt sitting in someone's hand for one year, it's fruit, it's going to, you know how fruit is. It's not that, you know, that there was refrigeration <laughs> to keep it fresh. Everything was just so perfect. It was this, and it wasn't like a new fruit salad that Krishna... <laughs> Everything was exactly as it had been when a year before, when Krishna was just innocently looking around for his calves and his friends. And this bewildered Brahma the most. And it was at that point that he realized what it means that God is great. It was at this point that he, in his total humility, that I am nothing, he gave the example that when a firefly is on a moonless night, he gives off his light and thinks, I am lighting up the whole sky. Now, those little, if you just try to understand this analogy from the perspective of a firefly, it's actually quite instructive. Because our perception of the entire creation is so um, relevant, a relative to our particular state of consciousness. How many of you have ever looked closely at a firefly? Please raise your hand. You've seen fireflies. You have them in India, yes, where they go and they light up. Anyways, you know, I've done my little studies after this reading Brahma's prayers. Show me with your fingers what is the size of a firefly's eyes? (laughs) Can you do it? You can't even make it small enough. They're only this big and their eyes are tiny, tiny little eyes. So how much can those eyes see. You know, your eye is much bigger. Your one eyeball, if we want to get analytically, is probably hundreds of times heavier than a firefly's entire body. Yes? Your one eyeball probably has the weight of thousands and thousands of fireflies. So what is the size of one firefly's eye? 
It's tiny. So how much can that little eye see? Can't see that much. So in the night, when the firefly, and it's the male fireflies that have the light, when they go bzzz, and the, the light goes bzzz, and they can't keep it for very long. You see fireflies, they go bzzz, bzzz, bzzz. I've told this story before at Gita Nagari, you know, when I was with Bhakti Tirtha Swami Maharaj, the place I was staying, Yadunanan Prabhu and Taruni Devi's home. It's kind of in a very, very um, quiet agricultural fields and forests around their house. And when I would come to their home, you know, I would come back at, at night sometimes being with His Holiness Bhakti Tirtha Swami Maharaj. And there were hundreds and hundreds of fireflies in this field just near a forest. And they were just... Pss, pss, pss. It was like fireworks. It was incredible. The lights were just... Tsh, 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 tsh. It was supernatural. It was so natural. Supernatural natural. <laughs> So I just sat there and I was looking and thinking, this is just incredible. It's a nature. It's, it's a whole light show in the sky. Bzz, 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 bzz. And Yadu Nandan Prabhu, he comes and we're watching together. And he said, do you know why they're doing that? And I said, I don't know, but it's beautiful. He said, when the males want to attract the females they put off their light in order to, to mate the females, to attract the females to mate with them. I said, why did you have to tell me that? <laughs> you know, I'm a sannyasi and I'm you know, brahmachari and I'm not supposed to be watching you know, males attracting females to have sex. <laughs> He just ruined everything. <laughs> I thought they were just, you know, just, you know, just celebrating life or something like that. <laughs> so anyways, I went to sleep after that. <laughs> but those little fireflies, because they have such little tiny eyes in the darkness, when they let off that light... As far as their eyes could see, they're lighting up the whole sky. They really seem that they're lighting up the whole sky. Because they can't really see beyond that light that they... They can't see the darkness beyond their light. It's just all around them, the light. Ah, look, I'm lighting up the universe. But when the sun comes out... They, they can't make any difference anywhere. There's just no difference. So similarly, Brahma said, in ignorance of you, in darkness, only in darkness do I think that I'm a great person. But in the light of knowledge, I realize I'm insignificant. How great are you, Krishna? Krishna. So this ahankar, this ego, can only exist in the darkness of ignorance. Where there's light, Krishna Surya Samaya Hoya Andhakar. Srila Prabhupada would love to quote Lord Chaitanya's words, that Krishna is like the sun and Maya is like darkness. Where there is the sun, darkness cannot be. So when we actually have some experience of Krishna, a real experience, that light, that light of Krishna's presence, if we're actually experiencing, we will become totally humbled by that experience. People could talk about Krishna. People could quote verses of Krishna. People could speak all sorts of philosophy and everything. But if they're proud, 
That means they're not in the light. They're still in darkness. Ego can only exist in darkness where we think I'm great. But when we actually experience Krishna's greatness, even Brahma considered himself insignificant. What is our position? Brahma lives 311 trillion years and never gets old. Never gets sick. Incredible personality. He knows all the Vedas. He spoke all the Vedas. There's no power in the universe above Brahma's. How many powers are above ours? So Brahma's thinking like that. Why? He's totally humble because he's in the light of knowledge of Krishna. Not just theoretical knowledge, but actual knowledge, realization. So this is the test. (coughs) One who actually knows Krishna is totally humbled. There can be no false ego if we know Krishna. False ego can only exist in darkness. And that's actually the way a devotee evaluates himself or herself. Not just on the basis of what people say about me and on the basis of um, what I can do or what I've done. But the real test that we learn again and again in the scriptures, it's there in so many stories, but somehow or other we seem to focus on other aspects. But it's the core, it's the foundation. That our our testimony of how much we know Krishna is how we don't have a false ego. How we're totally humbled to serve. You see... In the darkness, one firefly could go, and another firefly could go, and they're both doing the best they can. And one firefly in the darkness is saying, I am better than you. I can sing better than you. I can chant more slokas than you. I can give better classes than you. I could cook better than you. I'm stronger than you. I have accomplished more things than you. I have more disciples than you. I have more counselees than you. Right? We can, in the darkness, we can, and we see somebody else going, (laughs) (laughs) so we make a comparison. But when the light comes out, (laughs) there's no difference. In the, in the light of the sun, the firefly isn't saying, I'm giving more light than you. <laughs> doesn't really make any difference. Neither of us are really doing anything. <laughs> Krishna is, the sun is doing everything. So you see, this is actually the test that we're actually in the light of knowledge of Krishna is we're no longer feeling, oh, I'm envious of this person because they can do more or they have more, or I'm arrogant because they have less. That consciousness is just a symptom of darkness. It's the ego. When we become everyone's well-wisher because we see everyone in relation with Krishna, that's actually the sign that we're experiencing Krishna. We're in the light. No envy, no arrogance. We're simply so happy to see the sun of Krishna shining and we're so grateful to him. We don't have to prove ourselves. In the darkness, we have to prove ourselves to get some light in our life. 
but in the light. Our happiness, our pride is in the sun, which is illuminating everything and everyone. And it's unlimited. And from Krishna's perspective, the sun is how many times bigger than the earth? How many scientific people know this? Can anyone give me a Radhe Sham Prabhu? You are expert at all of these <laughs> subjects. Huh? Fourteen hundred thousand. One point four million. Okay. So this the earth. We know how big the earth is. One point four million times the sun is than the earth. But from the perspective of Krishna's light, you know, the Brahma Samhita tells that the whole Brahma Jyoti is coming from the body of Krishna. That's what a what a firefly that is. <laughs> the entire Brahma Jyoti is coming from Krishna. And it's not going, bzz, bzz, it's continuous forever. And the sun is getting its power from the Brahma Jyoti. So the sun, which is 1.4 million times bigger than the whole earth planet, is not even a firefly compared to Krishna's, the, the light that Krishna is giving out. So how great is Krishna? How wonderful is Krishna? So Shukadev Goswami is explaining these things with so much love, so much deep devotion. And Parikshit Maharaj is so eager to hear. And here we find that one who is eager to hear about Krishna, through that eagerness, Krishna reveals himself. And Shukadev Goswami is giving this beautiful benediction to all the readers of Srimad Bhagavatam for all time to come, that any person who hears or chants these pastimes of Lord Marari performed with his cowherd friends, the killing of Agasura, the taking of lunch on the forest, the Lord's manifestation of transcendental forms, and the wonderful prayers offered by Lord Brahma is sure to achieve all his spiritual desires. And in the purport, we find this beautiful statement by Srila Sanatan Goswami. Even one who is only inclined to hear and chant the pastimes of Lord Krishna will achieve spiritual perfection. That inclination, that eagerness, inclination means an eagerness, lolyam, this greed to hear about Krishna, to chant about Krishna, to serve Krishna. Krishna takes it so seriously. And in the purport it describes, we may have so many different types of services. Sometimes brahmacharis just want to sit and read all day. And they're told, you know, clean this, or do some puja, or go out and do this seva. But I just want to read. And sometimes grihastas, you know, mothers have their children, and they have their housework, and they have their cooking, and their everything else they do at the home. And the husbands, they have to go out and work so many hours, and 
Mumbai, through the traffic and all of the different pressures, with the economic situation. If you don't really perform really well, you might be treated like you have to work so much overtime and over hours, otherwise you'll lose your job, and if you lose your job, you won't be able to get another job because the economy is so bad. Yes, this is what I see and hear. A lot of pressure. And swamis don't have to, they don't have to make money like this, jobs, but we have to deal with all of you. (laughs) So it's practically as much pressure dealing with you as being you. So everybody has so many distractions from just sitting and reading Srimad Bhagavatam. (laughs) We should sit and read Srimad Bhagavatam as much as possible. But if we have other obligations, just the fact that we want to, just the fact that we're inclined, just the fact that when the opportunity comes, we do it, we get the same benefit. That eagerness is what connects us with Krishna. So when we hear this beautiful blessing by Shukadeva Goswami, and Shukadeva Goswami's blessings are not just, um, you know, encouraging words. They're the highest truth. We may not understand this. In some places he says, anyone who hears this story... If we Dhruva Maharaj, anyone who recites it on Dwadasi will get all spiritual, you know, all these blessings that come. If we actually do it properly in the spirit of Maharaj Pariksha, we do get all those blessings. So here, anyone who hears or chants these pastimes, which we have just discussed, Krishna's killing Agasura, his taking lunch with his cowherd boys in the forest grass, and how he manifests these wonderful forms and Brahma's prayers. Just this one Leela. If we have if we are if we are seriously inclined to hear it, and whenever possible we hear it, all of our spiritual desires will be fulfilled. doesn't say your material desires. <laughs> All your spiritual desires. And a, for a devotee, our only spiritual desire is to love Krishna, to please Krishna, to serve Krishna. They will all be desired, all be fulfilled. That is the power of Krishna. That is the power of his name. That is the power of his pastimes. And all we're expected is to be eager to receive them, to eager to reciprocate. Srila Prabhupada was traveling all over the world. And he would come to a place, when he would come to a place to give a class, I mean, devotees were so grateful. You know, of all the hundreds of temples and all the thousands of devotees, he's come to our little temple to give class. So much effort he made to be there, just to encourage the devotees, to enlighten them. And I had seen... I was at one community. He came in 1976... He was giving class, the teachings of Prahlad, and the temple room was completely full. It was not a big temple room. But everybody in the community and people from all other temples from different parts of America came just to be with Prabhupada there, so it was really, really super crowded. And there was no air conditioners or anything. So it was quite hot. 
Prabhupada sitting and he's speaking with so much enthusiasm and compassion. And I must tell you, because I there was no place for me to sit. So I was standing. I was standing like just outside the door, looking in. Because I had to milk cows, so I was a little... I came in just, you know, after everybody was assembled. And it was incredible. Because at least 75% of the people were sleeping in his class. Because, you know, they were hard working and they didn't get much sleep. Prabhupada's speaking in <laughs> And I was, I have to admit, I was standing up, I was going like this, but I didn't, I couldn't really fall asleep because I wasn't sitting down. But I was standing and because, you know, the, everyone, you only sleep a few hours and you work so hard and doing all these things. And, and Prabhupada, so much effort to come there to speak to us. And it's the only chance of the day for 95% of the community to be with Prabhupada. is only during his class. Otherwise, there's no access. And we're waiting for years for him to come. Just waiting, counting. He would only come once every two years. And we wouldn't see him any time except that. And finally he comes. And the one chance we get in the day to be with him. (laughs) I was just watching and thinking, this is really interesting. First day he gave class for about an hour. Second day, about a half hour. Third day, about 15 minutes. <laughs> and I remember he said, you are all very tired because you work so hard. <laughs> it was so encouraging. But even when everyone was sleeping, he was still so enthusiastic. If there was one person listening, that was good enough. He was totally enthusiastic to speak. But I was, we can't judge because even those people who, they may, the people sleeping may really have a very deep inclination to hear. They're just really tired. They want to hear, they want, they want, but... But we shouldn't be like that. <laughs> so this lolium, this eagerness, this strong inclination to hear and chant the glories of the Lord attracts Krishna's mercy, attracts Krishna's grace. And if we simply cultivate that, Srila Prabhupada, when I was in New York in 1972, I didn't know what his book distribution or anything. I just came from Vrindavan. Or, you know, that, that, nobody talked about those things there. But I, <clears throat> Srila Prabhupada was emphasizing his book distribution. And then he was very strong. He said, but not only you distribute these books, but you must read these books and you must understand these books. And that's where he said, if you go and give someone a book and someone asks, do you read these? What is it about? Do you read it? And you said, no, no, I don't read. I only distribute. (laughs) He said, who will take you seriously? If you want to be empowered to chant, you first have to hear if you want to really be empowered to give Krishna's, Srila Prabhupada's knowledge, we have to receive it. And that's where sustainable empowerment comes. Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami said, hearing and chanting is like the food grains that nourish us and give us strength. 
If we try to do our service but we don't eat food, we'll be weak. We will not survive on a physical level. On a spiritual level, unless we are sufficiently, proficiently hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord, we will become spiritually weak. And we will not be able to fulfill our purpose for some time, but it is not sustainable. Hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord is the urgent need of the soul. It's the foundation of our whole devotional service. That's why Srila Prabhupada had whatever, however busy we are, he wanted us to chant at least 16 rounds every day. He wanted us as far as possible to come to Srimad Bhagavatam or Bhagavad Gita class or to read his books. And if we do it with the proper consciousness, all our spiritual desires will be fulfilled. Is there any questions? Yes, Prabhu. Maharaj, you are mentioning that we should not compare with others what they are achieving, I am achieving. But that is helping if I compare that this devotee is very much empowered. So he is receiving special mercy of Krishna and is very dear to Krishna. We also aspire to uh, get some of his qualities. So is it good comparison, like if I see he is doing something better than what I am? If our comparison is an appreciation, then it's very good. But if it creates envy or arrogance, then that is a symptom of darkness, that we are in the darkness. Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami. He says that he takes the dust of the feet of every devotee, from the Paramhamsas to the brand new Bhakta. He says, I take the dust of their feet and worship them. That means in his comparison, he's lower than all of them. He's not envious. If you're envious of someone, you don't take the dust of the f- feet. <laughs> You take the dust of their feet because you honor them. Taking dust means doesn't mean you envy someone and you take the dust just to, you know, as a ritual. Taking dust of feet means you're humbling yourself and you're honoring the person. So in his comparison, he's honoring them for their greatness, for their devotion. So we should take inspiration from devotees. And for devotees who make mistakes, we could learn from their mistakes too. But we're not doing with envy or arrogance. If anything, we're doing it with compassion. And we're learning. Does that answer your question? Hare Krishna. Yes, Prabhu. Hare Krishna Maharaj. You gave three examples of the something happening in split moment through Tanpad, King Parikshit and also Brahma. So if something, that such moment also comes in the life of a sadhaka, that something is going to happen in a moment and don't have time to think and something like that. All these examples, they are like parts of Krishna's Leela itself. So how a devotee should handle and tackle such situations? Which situation? Something to be done in a moment and there is no time to think. So it may create disaster if we like. Our whole life should be to prepare for each moment. If you have a strong foundation, then when a storm comes, you'll have strength. So if we have the wisdom, the intelligence that is um, coming from hearing Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, Chaitanya Charitamrita. If we're, if we're suf- properly nourished with philosophy 
And if we're chanting the holy names properly and not committing offense to others, then we will get spiritual strength and spiritual intelligence. And when these moments come, we will be prepared. Otherwise, if we're not prepared and the moment comes, it's just like when I was in Vrindavan in 1971, there was a war between Pakistan and India. So at night, everyone was told to stay inside. And everyone was told to put, to either not, they would actually cut all the electricity for the whole Vrindavan. They would cut all the electricity. And if you had a candle or something, you were supposed to put a black, like, covering over your window. The idea is when the enemy planes would come over, if they see light, then they'll bomb. So there was preparation, yes? So if you know you're going to be attacked, then you prepare yourself to make yourself safe. It's not that just, you know, just do anything you want. It doesn't matter if the enemy planes come, they will come. That was preparation. So we know Maya is going to attack. Definitely. She will attack you every day in so many ways from within and without. So we should prepare ourselves. We prepare ourselves by our chanting attentively, by our hearing Srimad Bhagavatam, by our avoiding offenses to others, by the sincerity of our seva, by our prayer, sharanagati, our prayer of, of, of feeling helpless and crying out for Krishna's mercy. And then when the storms come, when the attacks come, we have some preparation. And even in that split moment, if we make, we have, we have to really use all the strength we're having at that moment to act with integrity. But if for some reason, because of that moment, we say something or do something that's not right, then almost immediately we'll understand that I made a mistake and we will rectify it. But if we're not prepared, we won't rectify it. We won't even admit we made a mistake. We'll try, we'll use our intelligence to justify it and perpetuate it. Yes? So we should prepare. And the preparation gives us strength to not make mistakes. And if somehow or other we do, it gives us the strength to immediately rectify it. Does that answer your question? Narasimha Nanda Prabhu, please give us some wisdom. The microphone is coming. You were mentioning how um, Lord Brahma has gotten the most uh, he, he knows all the Vedas and he is the creator of the creator of the creator in this universe so how is it that with all that knowledge and all that mercy he gets even by Krishna appearing and giving lessons to him to humble him that sometimes Lord Brahmas fall down and descend into the lower species. I never quite understood that. Not all Brahmas are pure devotees. But this particular Brahma is a Paramahamsa pure devotee. He's the Acharya of our Sampradaya. So he's a special Lord Brahma. Hare Krishna. <laughs> uh, you had mentioned earlier about the um, reciprocation of the listener and the speaker. And I'm wondering if you could just speak a few words about the reciprocation 
in that respect between Lord Chaitanya and Ramananda Rai in their conversations. Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami explains it that Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is like the unlimited ocean of Krishna Tattva, Bhakti Tattva, Rasa Tattva, truths about Krishna, Krishna, truths about Bhakti, devotional service, and truths about the intimate, ecstatic, loving affairs between Radha and Krishna. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is that unlimited shoreless ocean. And Ramananda Rai was like a cloud. And the ocean was giving water to the cloud, and then the cloud was pouring the water back into the ocean. And Lord Chaitanya, genuinely, he wasn't just acting, <laughs> even though he's the ocean. He was humbled by Ramananda Rai. He was not just speaking, you know, poetically. He was speaking from his heart. The Lord is feeling. Ramananda, he was praise. He was praising with such gratitude, Ramananda Rai. You have Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya is so kind to me that he sent me to see you. And now you are enlightening me. You are giving me so much uh, shower, unlimited shower of nectar. And Ramananda Rai, he was so humble. He said, no. He said, you are like the musician. And I am like the stringed instrument. The stringed instrument can't make any sound. The only sound he makes is what the musician makes him. And an instrument itself doesn't play beautiful melodies. You know, if you if you give a sitar to someone like me, you'll just get like... But if you give a sitar to the great late Ravi Shankar, he'll play, you know, beautiful ragas all night long. So it's not the sitar that's great, it's the player. So Ramananda Rai said, you are the musician. My tongue is like a stringed instrument, and you are making me speak all these words. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he replied, he said, no. He said, I am just a Mayavadi sannyasi floating in all of these misconceptions and by the grace of Sarvabhoma Tachacharya he has sent me to you just to enlighten me and save me. He's feeling this way. And Ramananda Rai is saying Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya is so kind and so fatherly and loving toward me that he sent you to me only to deliver me. <laughs> and in this way They're both praising each other. Lord Chaitanya himself is so eager to hear and he's giving all credit to Ramananda Rai for speaking with so much love and devotion and so much knowledge. And Ramananda Rai is giving all credit to Lord Chaitanya that because of your eagerness to hear you are empowering me to speak. So well, this is the loving relationship between the two. And this is actually the standard on our own very small level of harikata in comparison. I mean, who, Lord Chaitanya is Krishna in the loving emotions of Sri Radha. And Ramananda Rai is Vishak is Vishaka Devi, one of Srimati Radharani's two most intimate expansions and loving associates from Goloka Vrindavan. What a conversation they're having. And by Prabhupada's mercy, we could, we could be right there listening to, to it. Would you like to give us some wisdom? 
I'd like to, but I'm just going, <laughs> and you're going, <laughs> See, when, when you do it, everyone laughs. When I did it, and nobody cared. So. <laughs> Your potency, your illuminating potency. Hare Krishna. Yadubhar Prabhu, would you like to speak something? You can pass the microphone. Again, such a beautiful presentation. I personally am awed and struck by your devotion and knowledge, Maharaj. Every time. It never fails. (laughs) Hare Krishna. Thank you. I'm not going to ask you to say anything else after that. You are my senior elder brother trying to encourage me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Thank you very much.